Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing beautifully well today. Today for something a little bit different. Today's video is all about overcoming adversity, real adversity, not fake adversity. So in my line of work, quote unquote, I get a lot of people uh, raging, really, really a lot of hatred because, for instance, the DCS at this time, early September 2020, the DCS F-16, after nine or ten months, doesn't have its Mavericks yet. People are very, very upset by that, and they'll call Eagle Dynamics terrible things. They'll call Grim Reapers terrible things that I, I wouldn't dare say to someone. And it's hard to have sympathy for these guys. Is it annoying that we don't have Mavericks? Sure, it's annoying that we don't have Mavericks. Is it a real-world problem in any way, waiting for the Mavericks? Not really. So it's really hard for people, and some people have real problems, and they have to overcome these problems, and they don't moan about it. They just get on with it overcome it which kind of leads me to a kind of ad libbing here but it leads me to something or some several things that i've learned in my 39 years my 39 years have been odd 39 years i haven't just been stuck in an office uh, and i don't watch tv you know I, I do different things i've run businesses i work for several companies and stuff so i've had a fairly varied life and things i've learned i haven't made these up these aren't my inventions but things i've learned through hard experience and trial and error which is usually how i learn as you probably know is that judging people Judging people is fine. You're allowed to judge people. I'll tell you the first one is, you judge a man, or I guess you'd say you judge a person nowadays, you judge a person by the content of their character. Was that MLK, RC? Judge a content Did by the character? That, that was Martin Luther uh, King, wasn't it? Judge a person by the content of their character? Someone said it. Anyway. Uh, I, I want to say, I don't know. I think it, it might We think it might be MLK. It doesn't matter any, really, whatever. You judge it, so you don't judge a person by what they look like what they sound like, where they come from, where they're going, anything like that. You judge them by the content of their character. Uh, and that comes into overcoming, you know, this is how they attack problems, how they overcome problems in their life. That's the content of their character. Do they sit and moan about it or do they get on, they do something, overcome it, don't moan about it because moaning about it just makes other people feel bad and it's just, there's no productivity in it at all. And the second thing that I've learned is you judge a man or a person by the company they keep. That's a really important one as well. Who do these people surround themselves with? That has, has proven to me a very good way of judging whether they're a good person, a bad person, however you want to metric it. So, you judge a person whether they have mavericks or not, says the stream. <laughs> stream is very good. Uh, first of all, apology, you know me, I'm just stupid. And um, uh, the guy who suggested this video, I've completely lost. I've, I've waited for ages to make this video and I just cannot find their request. So my apologies. I know they were disabled in some way or another. Uh, if you're allowed to even say that anymore, I don't know. And they wanted this video as an example. Captain Sir Douglas Robert Stuart Barder, World War II ace of the Royal Air Force. Handsome chap, as we can see there. He was credited with 22 aerial victories, which is amazing. Four shared victories, six probables, and one shared probable, and 11 enemy aircraft damage, which is, uh, you know, an amazing career. Barda joined the RAF in 1928 and was commissioned in 1930. In December 1931, while attempting some aerobatics, he crashed and lost both his legs. That's a real problem, RC. Crashing and losing both of your legs. Uh, having been on the brink of death, he recovered, retook flight training with no legs, passed his flight checks, and then requested reactivation as a pilot. Although there were no regulations applicable to his situation, he was retired against his will on medical grounds. Kind of fair enough, right? No rudder pedals and so on. After the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, however, Douglas Barter returned to the RAF and was accepted as a pilot. He scored his first victories over Dunkirk during the Battle of France in 1940. He then took part in the Battle of Britain and became a friend and supporter of Air Vice Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory and his big wing experiments. Big wing. We do that, don't we, RC? We do big wing. In August 1941, Barter bailed out over... How do you bail out with no legs? It's crazy, right? Barda bailed out over German-occupied France and was captured. Soon afterwards, he met and was befriended by Adolf Gallant, a prominent German fighter ace, which is cool. Despite his disability, Barda made a number of escape attempts and was eventually sent to the prisoner of war camp Colditz Castle. I'm sure you all know the stories of, of Colditz Castle and the, the, the various attempts and stuff. He remained there until April 1945, when the camp was liberated by the first uh, United States Army. Barda was born in 21 February 1910 in St. John's Wood, London, the second son of Frederick Roberts Barda, a civil engineer, and his wife, Jessie Scott Mackenzie. His first two years were spent with McCann relatives in the Isle of Man. I've been there. God, that's a lovely place. 
while his father, accompanied by Bala's mother and older brother Frederick, named after his father but called Derek to distinguish them, returned to his work in India after the birth of his son. At the age of two, Bala joined his parents in India for a year. When his father resigned from the job in 1913, the family moved back to London, joining the RAF. In 1928, Bala joined the RAF as an officer in the Cadet Royal Air Force College Cranwell in rural Lincolnshire. I've been there. Uh, he continued to excel at sports and added hockey and boxing to his repertoire. Motorcycling was tolerated at Cranwell, though cadets usually took part in the band activities such as speeding, pillion racing, and buying and racing motor cars. <laughs> uh, Bada was involved in these activities and was close to expulsion after being caught out too often. On 13th September 1928, Bada took his first flight with instructor uh, flying officer W.J. Pissy Pearson in Avro 504. After just 11 hours and 50 minutes of flight time, he flew his first solo. 19th February 1929. After one training flight as at the gunnery range, Bardo achieved only a 38% hit rate on a target. Receiving jibes from a rival squadron number 25th Squadron RAF, Bardo took off and performed aerobatics to show off his skill. It was against regulations, and he was a true reaper, this guy. And seven out of 23 accidents caused by ignoring regulations had proven fatal. The commanding officer of number 25 squadron remarked that he would order Bada to face a court martial if Bada was in his unit. The squadron had won the Hendon Air Show Pairs event in 1929-1930. In Bada teamed with Harry Day, successfully defended the squadron's title in the spring that year. In late 31, Bada undertook training for the 1932 Hendon Air Show, hoping to win a second consecutive title. Two pilots had been killed attempting aerobatics. The pilots were warned not to practice these manoeuvres under 2,000 feet, 610 metres, and to keep above 500 feet at all times. Now, this is before proper regs, right? So, this is more advisory. Nevertheless, on 14 December 1931, while visiting Reading Aero Club, Bart attempted some low-flying aerobatics at Woodley Air Force Field in a Bulldog Mark IIa of 23 Squadron, apparently on a dare. His aircraft crashed when the tip of the left wing touched the ground. Both his legs were amputated, one above the knee, one below the knee. Got a lovely picture there of Adolf being booted. Bada got his chance to prove that he could fly it still when, in June 1932, Air Undersecretary Philip Sassoon arranged for him to take up a Navro 504, which he piloted competently. A subsequent medical examination proved him fit for active service, but in April 1933 he was notified that the RAF had decided to reverse the decision on grounds that his situation was not covered by King's regulations. In May, Bada was invalidated out of the RAF, returned to the RAF. Against a background of increasing tensions in Europe 1937-39, Bada repeatedly requested that the Air Ministry accept him back into the RAF and he was finally invited to a selection board meeting at Industrial House in London's Kingsway. Bada was disappointed to learn that it was only ground jobs that were being offered. It appeared that he would be refused a flying position, but Air Vice Marshal Hallahan commented of RAF Cranwell in Bada's days there, personally endorsed him and asked the Central Flying School up even to assess its capabilities. On 14 October 1939, the Central Flying School requested Bada report for flight lessons on 18 October. He did not wait. Driving down the next morning, Bada undertook refresher courses. Despite reluctance on the part of the establishment to allow him to apply for an A1B full flying category status, his persistent essence efforts paid off. Bada regained a medical categorization for operational flying at the end of November 39 and was posted to Central Flying School for a refresher course of modern types of aircraft. On 27 November, eight years after his accident, Bada flew solo again in an Avril Tutor. Once airborne, he could not resist the temptation to turn the bay plane upside down at 600 feet inside the circuit area. Bada subsequently progressed through the ferry battle and Miles Master, the last training stage before flying Spitfire and Hurricanes. Battle of Britain, something you all know about. On 11 July, Bada scored his first victory with his new squadron. Spotting the aircraft at 600 yards, Bada recognised it as a Dornier D017, and after he closed to 250 yards, its rear gunner opened fire. Bada continued his attack and fired two bursts into the bomber before it vanished into a cloud of Dornier, which crashed into the sea. 21 August, a similar engagement took place where he, where high, where he scored another Dornier kill. Later in the month, Bada scored a further two victories over Messerschmitt Bf 110s. On 7 September, Bada claimed two Bf 109s shot down, followed by a Junkers Ju 88. 
and the list of claimed victories goes on through the war and by the end of his career 22 confirmed kills and over 11 damaged aircraft of all type the last fight on 9 August 1941, Barker was flying a Spitfire Mark 5A on patrol over the French coast, looking for Messerschmitt Bf 109s. A few were spotted flying in formation approximately two, 3,000 feet uh, below him and travelling in the same direction. Barker dived on them too fast and too steeply and was able to aim and fire his guns and barely avoided colliding with one of them. He levelled out at 24,000 feet to find that he was now alone, separated from his section, and was considering whether to return home when he spotted three pairs of bf 109s a couple of miles in front of him. He dropped down below them and closed up before destroying one of them with a short burst of fire from close range. Barda was just opening fire on the second bf 109 which trailed white smoke and dropped down when he noticed the two on his left turning towards him. At this point, he decided it would be better to return home. However, making the mistake of banking away from them, Bada believed he had a mid-air collision with the second of the BF-29s on his right. Well, a kill's a kill. Bada's fuselage tail and fin were gone from behind him, and he lost height rapidly at what he estimated to be about 400 miles an hour. Yikes! That's hard to eject from in a slow spin. He jettisoned his, can his cockpit canopy, released his harness spin, and the air rushing past the cockpit started to suck him out. But the prosthetic leg was strapped in. Part of the way out of the cockpit and still attached to his aircraft, Barda fell for some time before he realised his parachute, uh, at which point the leg's retraining strap snapped under the strain and he was pulled free. We've got a sweet uh, depiction there. Uh, Barda struggled to free himself with the fight of falling from the sky. Picture of him getting into the spit. Two legs of wood and nerves of steel, all that it took to get Barda back in the skies. Prisoners of war. Bader was captured as a POW. The uh, Germans treated Bader with great respect. When Bader was taken prisoner, he was sent to the hospital near saint omer near the place where his father's grave is located on leaving the hospital. Colonel Adolf Grant pictured below, and his pilots invited him on their airfield, and they received him as a friend. Bader was cordially invited to sit in a cockpit of Gallant's personal ME-109. Asked Gallant if it was possible to test the 109 by a fly around the airfield. Gallant refused him with laughter. Bader had lost a prosthetic leg when escaping his disabled aircraft when he had bailed out. Bader's right prosthetic leg became trapped in the aircraft and he escaped only when the leg's retaining snap snapped after he pulled the ripcord of his parachute well, so he'd snap his own leg off. General Adolf Gallant notified the British of his damaged leg and offered them safe passage to drop off a replacement. Hermann Göring uh, himself gave the green light for an, the operation. The British responded on 19 August 1941 with, uh, with the leg operation. Never heard of that. Uh, an RAF bomber was allowed to drop a new prosthetic leg by parachute to St. Omer, a Luftwaffe base in the occupied France. So we've got uh, him walking there with his new leg and Gallant and other guys in old age. And that's it. So that's our story of, uh, of Mr. Bader. And the moral of the story is, of course, strength over adversity. So just think next time uh, something's really bugging you and if you're going to shout at people and call people bad names and try and make them feel bad, is that really the thing to do? I hope you enjoyed and see you later.